Hello, this is the chapter 13 uh, screencast and we're looking at land food and pest management. So uh, we're going to try to go through this pretty quickly to cut down on the uh, number of lectures that I put into this. Uh, but starting off, uh, we're looking at different types of collections or um, clear cutting comparison to uh, selective cutting for trees. And there's two different ways you can look at this. One is if you were doing something just like a crop, for example, if you're planting carrots or something or Christmas trees, as this example is kind of showing here. Uh, if you have one type of a species that you're collecting, clear cutting works fine. But if you're looking for more of a diverse setting, you have different uh, needs for different species. So when you do a clear cutting, some species may require different growing conditions, for example, shade. And if we remove all of the trees at once, trees that require shade aren't going to grow. So therefore, using more of a selective cutting would allow more of a shade setting in which you could you know, maintain the integrity of the forest and a greater biodiversity. Uh, as far as making a collection, let's stick with forestry. There is a kind of a break even. So the, the best time to gather or collect um, a harvest would be during the fastest growth period of the species. Once they get to a certain age, trees don't grow at much of a as high of a rate as they were um, early on. So when f trees first start off, there's kind of a lag time in their growth, but eventually they speed up rather quickly. And somewhere in that mix is when you want to collect your harvest. Forest fires. Uh, that's kind of a hot topic, well always, but currently here in 2014 in Los Angeles uh, we kind of see the effects of this, that uh, fires are completely natural, it's not a problem that humans created outside of the fact that we don't have them regularly enough. So because we have prevented fires, small fires, uh, eventually you get really big fires occasionally. There's nothing we can do to prevent that. Um, other than let nature just take care of itself and occasionally you get fires. It's a natural process. Uh, as far as types of forests, there's different classifications that we can look at. Um, we have our national parks. We have one of those here in Michigan, Isle Royal. And uh, this is just set aside to kind of preserve a natural um, scenic view, just leaving the land and everything within it alone. Uh, little interference from humans. You have your refuges in which you're establishing an area um, for the purpose of protecting a certain species, um, whether it's uh, you know trees, flowers, birds, wolves, whatever. And then you have a wilderness area in which, again, you're leaving a specific location aside just to preserve the ecosystem and everything else that um, lies within. Uh, federal lands, this is something interesting for us living in Michigan because we don't necessarily have a lot of federal lands. Uh, most of our federal lands, 28% listed here, is uh, out in the west, or the majority of, uh, let's back up a step, 20% uh, of all the U.S. is actually federally owned, but the vast majority of it is out here in the west. So when you look at a place like Nevada, interestingly, this red pen doesn't show up at all over there, uh, but, you know, the whole state of Nevada is pretty much uh, federally owned. Very interesting. So, as far as the usage of these lands, we have all these mixed uses. We won't go through each and every one of these, but we will, we will kind of point out here is they all have a similar traits amongst all of them, is that in some one way or another, um, recreation is one of the uses of those particular locations. So we have these different services that uh, manage them, but they all are somewhat set aside for recreational uses of the people for the people. Uh, regulations, uh, whenever there is like a federal product project, think of like a freeway, uh, you have this kind of like an effect in you know National Environmental Policy Act, which looks at the impact. What are we going to be doing to the land in there and how are we going to necessarily repair the damage that will be done. So as an example, when they put an interstate highway through a particular location, you may have to fill in wetlands. So okay, we've outlined that. What are we going to do to replace or create an equitable wetlands someplace else? 
So it's, as far as when federal dollars are spent, this is something that needs to be done. Urban sprawl, uh, us living here in the Plymouth Canton area, we are the direct result of urban sprawl. And there's kind of what we call like a smart growth, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. But it's a bit of a circle as far as some of these problems that we have within urban sprawl. Uh, as far as you know, people don't like, they wanna move out of the city for one reason or another. And well, let's look at this next slide over here. It might give us a better discussion point. Uh, people want to move out to the suburbs. They just like it out there. It's more spread out. So I just don't like all the smog and pollution, whatever else you have, complaints you might have. So when people leave the, the cities, what they find is the city no longer has their revenue coming in. So they no longer have the money to spend on services or less money to spend on services. Less money to spend on services. Uh, customers, people living in the cities are upset with the services they're not receiving. So therefore they want to leave. When they leave, neighborhoods decline and the remaining people still in the area don't like this any longer. It's no longer a place they want to raise their children. They move out to the suburbs and the cycle just gets worse and worse. We have an excellent picture of this in the city of Detroit, which is why the problem seems to get worse and worse every year. Um, obviously we're trying to fix that. Uh, now, the problems with us moving out to the suburbs, that's not necessarily a good um, environmental solution because people move out to the suburbs, therefore they are commuting to work. And typically here in Southeast Michigan, we use cars for that. So all this commuting time, uh, of course, is going to use a lot of gasoline, put CO2 in the atmosphere, we all know that. Um, the other problem is that is it creates a tax. Okay, so where does this tax dollars go? It goes to making more highways instead of money going back into the city for enhanced services for all. It's going on to these outside projects and it's kind of spreading the amount of dollars further and further and further. So we're all getting a little less because all this work is getting spread over a greater area. And then you get what's called the sprawl, urban sprawl. And it just keeps going and going and going. <clears throat> These are just some of the uh, things that have come in place as far as why we have this urban sprawl. Um, the system is actually designed to uh, enhance or allow urban sprawl to take place based upon how mortgages are used, zoning is done. Um, some cities, the classic example I like to use is in Portland, Oregon. Uh, you are not allowed to build within a certain belt outside of the city of Portland. So if you're going to move out, it's going to be quite a ways out. So it kind of forces any development or redevelopment to stay within the city boundaries. So this is some examples of some better smart growth. We won't go through the, the whole scenario, but it's just kind of making a mix that works for everyone. One of the things we can look at here is this mixed land use. So you have parks, you have housing, uh, you have good schools. Um, everyone is kind of involved in the process and you have a variety of types of homes. So you have your middle, low and high end foam, ho homes all in one location. All right, shifting gears away from land development, we're gonna get into food. So we'll do this for just a couple of minutes and then we'll break and go on to the next lecture. So uh, one of the overall things we're looking at here with uh, food is gonna be the development of how we've been changing food. Uh, the chapter starts off looking at uh, the something called uh, golden rice, which was rice that had vitamin A placed into it to theoretically uh, provide as far nutrition for people that don't necessarily get it strictly from rice because rice is just, uh, it's a carbohydrate and that's about it. So we're genetically modifying our food to put these nutrients in there, which is somewhat debatable if it's good or bad long-term. And we just went over all this as far as, you know, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? All right, I'm going to take a break here and we're going to move on to uh, the second lecture with food security. <laughs>